Good evening and a very warm welcome today. Um, I'm Matthias Kettemann and I'm very happy uh, to uh, welcome you here to the first uh, edition of Insights and Power. This is a conversation uh, series organized by the Leibniz Institute for Media Research, the Hans Bredow Institute, and the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, together with the Global Network for Internet and Society Research Centers. Many thanks go to our media part partner, uh, Tide uh, Hamburg, uh, as well. Today we focus on an important topic. We focus on great expectations, what research expects from platforms and platforms from research. We know that content governance is a very, very hard job. Big uh, platforms like YouTube have to push back against state actors. They have to de-platform coordinated and authentic behavior. They have to fight human rights abuses on their platforms. At the same time, they have to stay attractive communication spaces. The world is evolving. How do they evolve with them? To answer these questions, I'm very pleased to have um, a high-level uh, tech uh, expert here and uh, an academic who will discuss these questions together. We have uh, Susan uh, Wojcicki, the CEO of YouTube, um, a well-known digital platform all of us uh, are using, used by two billion people all across the globe to access information, to share videos, and to shape culture. Uh, Susan has been overseeing YouTube's content and business operation, the engineering and product development. Prior to joining YouTube, she has been influential, influential in uh, developing the, the ad uh, uh, business uh, at Google. She graduated with honors from Harvard University and holds uh, a number of additional uh, degrees. In 2015, she was named uh, to Time's list of the 100 most influential people in the world. A very warm welcome, Susan. Very pleased to have you uh, here with us today. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thank you. And we also have uh, Wolfgang uh, Schultz, Professor Wolfgang Schultz. He is a director of the Leibniz Institute for Media Research, the Hans Bredow Institute, and is the professor for media law and public law at the University of Hamburg. He's also research director of the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. He has been working on freedom of communication and media law issues for a number of decades and has been instrumental in uh, taking a global view on how uh, the internet develops and how platforms develop their normative orders. Before we start um, with the conversation, I would like uh, the audience uh, to invite uh, you to participate in the discussions with your questions. You can either do that uh, directly next to the video in our live stream or uh, via the Slido tool, uh, and you'll find the link uh, in, uh, below uh, the video. But now, let's uh, jump right uh, into, uh, into the future. Uh, looking back, um, uh, Susan, do you think that uh, the, the pandemic, which is still raging all across the world, will this be seen as a game changer uh, regarding how platforms deal with content? So for us, when the pandemic hit, it was after many, many years that we had been working on all of our responsibility work. We had been investing across um, policy, technology, enforcement, all areas. And I'm very thankful for that investment over many, many years because that enabled us to take action very, very quickly when the pandemic hit. Uh, we had to implement over 10 different policies. Um, we had to impl implement them incredibly quickly. Uh, um, for example, we saw that people were, were accusing um, telecom equipment for being the cause of COVID-19. And we had to basically immediately say, no, you only, you can't say that it's something other than the virus that is causing COVID and immediately make those decisions and remove those videos. Um, so across the board, we hadn't been investing for many, many years. And I'm very thankful because that enabled us to make so many quick decisions and also to be very active um, in our enforcement, which we do with a combination of people and machines to make sure that we're removing that content as quickly as possible. But with the pandemic, I mean, we also saw that as a huge opportunity for us to help deliver you know, um, authoritative information. So we worked with over 80 different health country groups um, to make sure that we were working with them with what the latest information was. We put that at the top of our feed so people saw that. Um, we worked with YouTube creators to be able to talk about 
um, how it was important for people to stay home, to take COVID seriously, which was an issue at first. People thought it was a chance to go out more. And um, we made sure that the creators uh, really emphasized the need to take it seriously um, and use creators to actually reach into a lot of different groups that otherwise wouldn't have been able to talk to public health officials. So for example, in the US, for example, we had Dr. Fauci meet with various rappers um, and, and talk about the importance of uh, the, the precautionary measures to prevent people uh, from getting COVID. So those are all different things that we did. And I'm extremely thankful for all the years and years of work ahead of time to make sure that we were ready for the pandemic. Not that we knew it was coming, um, but but just to be able to handle such a tough event like that. Uh, Wolfgang, have you also met with rappers in your uh, scientific uh, analysis <laughs> of, of how to deal, how platforms deal with the virus? <laughs> yes, yes, uh, in a way I have. Um, but I would like to build on one one aspect that uh, you, Susan, mentioned a minute ago, uh, because that has been discussed uh, um, um, in academic circles as well as uh, with uh, NGOs in this field, and that is uh, the element of automation in, in content moderation and um, how that developed during COVID. So um, uh, we all know that it, with this amount of content, it's impossible to do that uh, without uh, technical support. Um, but on the other hand, at least what we heard was that uh, uh, on many platforms that played a greater role because um, the human content reviewers were simply not there. They could not gather in their offices. And so technology played a, a greater role um, that I think has led to uh, more experience in, in the companies about how to implement that, but maybe also to see the limits of, of this kind of automation. Um, would love to hear a little bit about uh, the experience you made with including technology here. And maybe if you want to share that, what the, the future plans are in, in this respect. Sure, sure. Um, well, so definitely when the pandemic hit, we, we, we realized that we were going to have to send a lot of our human reviewers home. Um, we have human reviewers around the globe and we do that on purpose to make sure that we can respond to any kind of event and we're not dependent upon any one location going down. But with something like the pandemic, we had so many people, for example, that would be unable to do their work at home or it wouldn't be, um, it just wouldn't be possible. So we actually, within a couple of weeks, we actually built a system to move 100% to machines. Um, because we knew the pandemic was coming. We knew that we were going to have to lose our workers. Um, and in a couple of weeks, we built this 100% automated system to manage content moderation. Um, again, this was, we had already been working on this for years and years. And so, um, and I can maybe for, for people give a little bit of background about how generally our automation systems work, which is that we use our machines basically to go out and cast a net and to identify what is content that could be problematic. Um, and then we use the human reviewers to say, yes, it is problematic or no, it's not. Um, and there's some content like, let's just say um, there's adult content, for example, that's very easy to identify with machines, but something about hate and harassment has a lot more nuance and context and could be mixed with political speech. And that's where we would want to have humans spend more time understanding the context to make the right decisions. But with something like the pandemic, we didn't have a choice. We had no mm. um, very small set of reviewers. So basically we built the system that worked entirely with machines and we used the small set of full-time employees to handle the appeals. When people, someone said, no, you made a mistake, um, can, can you check? Um, so we used our full-time employees for that. And I think what we saw is that, you know, sure we can do that, um, but we made, a, we made mistakes. And that's not our intention at all. Um, we realize that YouTube is used by so many people to communicate, um, to express their ideas. A lot of creators are generate, we share half of our revenue with creators. And so there are many small businesses. And so when we're making a mistake and that's impacting their revenue, uh, that's, um, that's not good for anyone. And so um, we have gone back to using a combination of machines and people, um, but we certainly learned during that process that you know what the limits were of just having machines. Thank you, thank you, both of you. So um, we've we've uh, you've mentioned you know, this this important that that you see yourself that is the, the important position that that you you have that YouTube has in how to deal with with content whether to downrank it to demonetize it. Um, depending on on the jurisdiction you're in, you know, in, in some countries mm -hmm. uh, like Germany. 
uh, courts have taken a, a rather strong position on, on the limits of what platforms uh, can do, uh, that they must not act arbitrarily or that they have to stick to their, 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 their standards and implement them. So, so how, um, how, how does that, that, that work in practice? You perhaps can, can elaborate a, a bit on that. How, how do you make sure that uh, in light of the many different jurisdictions out there, you, 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 you navigate this, uh, this, this, uh, um, um, this, this minefield between uh, national jurisdictions, between keeping uh, advertisers happy, between keeping users interested? Sure, sure. No, great, great question. Uh, well, first of all, I'll say that for, uh, you know, we, we work around the globe and you're right, certainly there are many different laws and many different um, jurisdictions. And we, um, we, enforce the laws of the various jurisdictions around speech or what's considered safe or not safe. Um, that's true for, for democratically elected governments. Um, it might get a little bit more complicated in, in non-democratically elected governments. Um, and, and for the most part, you know, so basically we, we enforce those laws. Um, that actually hasn't been the controversial part. What has been the controversial part has been when there is content that would be deemed as harmful, but yet is not illegal. Um, so an example of that, for example, would be COVID. Like, I'm not aware of there being you know, laws by government saying around COVID in terms of not being able to debate the efficacy of masks or where the virus came from or the right treatment or proposal, but yet there was a lot of pressure and concern about us um, distributing misinformation that went against what was considered the standard and accepted medical knowledge. Um, and so this category of harmful, but not, um, but, but legal has been, I think, where most of the discussion has been. And, you know, for us, we look at that content and we think about the, the role that we play in society. Um, we want to be doing the right thing for our users and for our creators. Um, we also generate revenue from advertisers. And if we are serving content that is seen by our advertising community as not benefiting society, um, no advertiser is going to want to appear on that. And they're certainly not going to even want to appear on a, a different you know, content that is positive if they think the platform as a whole is not being responsible. Mm -hmm. So we are generally very aligned. Like responsibility is really is good for our business. And we... Uh, you know, we have over 2 million creators on our platform that we share revenue with. So if we're not generating revenue for them, then you know, that's a problem for our creators. Um, they create you know, re beautiful and incredible content and we share the majority of revenue mm -hmm. with them. So, um, yeah, so, th so basically that's like, you know, so I think governments like can, can always, you know, our, our recommendation if governments want to have more control over online speech is to, to pass laws, to have that be very cleanly and clearly defined such that we can implement it. There are times that we see the laws being implemented or, or being suggested that they, um, they're, they're not necessarily clean or possible for us to cleanly interpret them. Um, and we've also seen sometimes there's laws passed just for the internet as opposed to for all speech. Um, and I, I do think that's a dangerous area when we start to get in and say, oh, sure, you could say something like this in a magazine or on TV, but you can't say it on the internet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I mean, the, the one the one group of people who's sometimes happy if the law is a bit vague is law professors, right? Because then they're called <laughs> upon to write uh, expensive uh, um, uh, papers on that. On exactly. So Wolfgang, um, what is your take on, uh, on on harmful content and the other sl slightly vague categories that some states, I think the UK, is actively considering using as a normative concept? Yes, yes. And surprisingly, I'm not so fond of all the regulatory approaches, even being a law professor here, uh, because mm -hmm. I definitely see that um, when we enter into speech regulation, and even more if we enter into this kind of uh, indirect speech uh, regulation in terms of uh, setting an incentive structure so that platforms are likely to, um, to take content down, um, then we are on a slippery slope. I see on the other hand that there is a lot of, uh, there are a lot of uh, things going on, amplification of disinformation and things like that. And I see why governments feel that they uh, need to act on that. Um, but um, having studied the German net CG and seeing what has been done in other countries, copying that, uh, 
um, laws mean different things in different countries. And uh, when you do not have a rule of law uh, based system in a country and no free uh, independent courts, uh, then something that might be a helpful tool in Germany is something uh, uh, really dangerous for freedom of speech on other platforms. So, um, so um, that's why even being a law professor, do not uh, applaud every regulatory attempt that is, is done here. Um, and the second thing that is interesting from our regulatory perspective, and um, again, I would be, be happy to hear Susan's uh, thoughts on that, is um, that we lawyers get more and more interested and in governance researchers in the internal rules, community standards and uh, terms of service of, of platforms, because they are in the level of, of speech regulation, if you want to call it that way, um, which has become immensely complex. And uh, we had uh, the opportunity, actually Matthias and myself, um, to do research on that, uh, not with YouTube. Um, and uh, what we saw is that um, the mental model with which people in um, uh, platform companies design that is actually the model that uh, kind of lawmaker has, saying we have different interests, we have to reconcile that, we have to balance that, we have to come to a fair uh, conclusion. Um, and I would be interested in if we had done the study and within YouTube, what your thoughts are, what is the model with which these internal laws, if I call it that way, these private uh, norms um, uh, are construed within YouTube? Is it more um, the design of, of, a, of a service or is it indeed um, with the different rights in mind that are balanced here when, when uh, you take the decision or create the norms based on which uh, content moderation is done. Mm. Okay. So, so is it more about uh, creating a, a community of values or an efficient communication space? Susan, do you, do you want to uh, come, come in on, on that? Sure, sure. Um, I mean, I think, you know, the, 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 the two, I mean, uh, you, you gave two choices and I do believe that YouTube is very efficient in communication and also provides a community around values. Um, and, you know, I, I think you're right. There certainly are tensions between freedom of speech and making sure people can communicate th those ideas um, as well as the need for us to, to be responsible as a platform in terms of how we distribute information. And, and those are definitely two tensions that we deal with. Um, and, you know, I would say you know, there we, we, we actually have this framework called the four R's, which you know, I can go over really quickly, which is basically our framework of responsibility, which is you know, basically we look at content um, that we would say would be most egregious. It doesn't make sense for us to distribute on our platform. Um, and there's many content that I think everyone agrees doesn't make sense. Um, you know, obviously, like um, violent extremism, making sure children are safe, um, hate, harassment, hate and harassment, there could be various definitions of where you draw those lines. But um, th there are certainly many categories that we we can all agree don't belong on a platform for dis for distribution. Um, then the second thing, and, and we remove, you know, we, we, we publish how many um, how much content we remove every quarter. Um, and then there's a lot of information topics where we believe it's important for us to highlight the, um, the experts, the authorities in the subject, similar to Google search, right? When you go to Google search and you type in COVID, you're not gonna see something from somebody who just you know, had an opinion yesterday. You're actually gonna see it from a national health organization um, that specializes in COVID. So the same thing we wanna make sure happens with recommendations that when you type in something about information that we're giving you authoritative information about it. So raising up the experts in, in information topics. That might not be true for music. Like in music, maybe you wanna know who's the latest artist that just became hot in the last month. Um, and it could be someone new, but you don't want to do that with information. In general, you want to go, you want to rely on the experts. Um, and then also, we've had this issue where we have content that will be borderline. It technically meets our standards, but it's considered lower quality content. Um, it's it's allowed. It's not like we want to be removing it, um, but we don't necessarily want it to be recommended. We don't want it to be that you come to YouTube and you see a lot of content that is generally seen as lower quality but it is possible to find it if you search for it um, or you go and you look for that specific creator. And that, that is basically our reduced section. And then lastly, we have to have a higher standard for 
for advertisers and for, for reward. And there's a lot of content that might make sense to have on the platform, but advertisers don't want to be associated with. That could be very important. A lot of even like, you know, headline news about tragic events, advertisers aren't going to want to be on, but are essential for society. Um, and so, you know, in, in, a, in essence, what I'm trying to say is that we're trying, what we have a, a series of, line, of lines that we draw on our policies, but then we have a series of gradation and gray in terms of how we handle in our recommendation systems to try to straddle those two conflicts that you're bringing up, which is the responsibility, and then also making sure that we're a platform to enable freedom of speech in different points of view. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let's transition to the uh, to, to another another topic. Um, um, are you um, are you getting slightly uh, uh, slightly annoyed by all of those new European rules? So, larger question: um, I mean, the European Union is getting more and more active, you know, in the terms of uh, digital regulation, um, and uh, you know, starting with the with the uh, GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation of some some years ago, that has had global effects. Uh, some researchers, like I know Bradford, call it the the Brussels mm -hmm. effect. You know, and we now have four four new uh, big bodies of, of rules coming out of Brussels soon: the Digital Services Act, the Digital Markets Act, and there's a Data Act, yeah. an AI Act coming. Um, yeah. So, um, how, how do you how do you feel as the? You know, I know it's, it's a global platform, but still, it's it's a US based sure. company. Um, how do you how do you feel having to talk to your European team all the time? Um, <laughs> does does Brussels have a legitimate role in? developing rules that apply basically globally in a way? We definitely understand the need for, for governments to want to regulate how platforms work, how they distribute information. And, and we recognize too the significant role that we play in societies and how that information is distributed. Um, I'd say there's a lot of regulation we already ha <clears throat> have to be compliant with. Um, copyright, child safety, um, hate, um, many, many different areas. Um, but you're right, there is a lot of new regulation coming out um, that we have been spending a lot of time to make sure that we understand and that we're working with. Um, and you know, so I would say on DSA, which is the one that we've probably been top of mind most recently, has been an area where we have been, um, you know, first of all, appreciate some parts of the current drafts um, and definitely appreciate there being uh, one regulator to start out with as opposed to 27, um, which actually is a huge and very important. It helps us do a much better job of understanding the law, being compliant in any way, um, and, and for our users too, for them to understand and have one set of laws it makes a lot of sense. Um, we also appreciate the intermediate liability that we saw, um, and we think that enables the internet to continue to provide all the value that it's provided. Um, but sometimes the, the laws are written in a way that are hard for us to understand how to implement or how to interpret. And I'd say in, in the current drafts, um, for example, there has been a phrase about notification to creators when there's any kind of restriction of visibility. Um, so that's sometimes where, as a person who, who builds these platforms and manages them, it's hard for us to understand what that even means because there's always changes in the visibility of videos where we have a large set of new videos all the time. We're ranking them differently based on our users' interest, based on what's happening in the news. Um, and so that could result in us, for example, sending hundreds of millions of emails to people saying there was a change in the ranking of your video, which, which happens all the time. Um, and so th there's other language around not talking about the restriction of visibility, but the restriction of accessibility. So if we were to change in some way that that content was accessible, that would make more sense. Um, there also, um, and, and I think that's the commission language that is, is um, that says that. Um, there's also language around audits and the frequency of those audits that could be um, just an undue burden, talks about the way that we would need to do that with any kind of product change. And that's really hard for us to, to know how to interpret because there are so many product changes where, where our products are constantly, we're all, they're always evolving. When an internet service is um, updating and changing and addressing what our users want and need. So something like an annual audit makes a lot of sense. Um, and so in general, I think we understand, but there are details in, in the implementation that sometimes we worry about having uh, implications that go that are unintended. And, and that's generally how we think about it. So you know, how can we work closely with governments to make sure that, that the, what they want um, from a protection is, is achieved, but that the unintended consequences 
that could hurt the platforms or the users or the creators, um, that that doesn't happen. Thanks. Love that. It, first of all, I admire your optimism that that will lead to a reduction of regulators, uh, numbers of regulators. <laughs> Apart from that, uh, because my, my take would be that we will have more at the end. Um, but um, I would be interested in not going too much into details of the DSA, but the, the broader concept behind that right. is interesting from our perspective. Um, and that is especially those elements that say um, that um, uh, your uh, terms of service and your community standards uh, will be in a way regulated. And so this kind of indirect uh, regulation comes in. And um, there, uh, I'm, I'm still wondering whether that is something which is a clever move because it leaves platforms the room to create their product uh, by designing this kind of, of rules and, and community standards. And at the same time, give the opportunity to make sure that some basic legal requirements are met. Um, but on the other hand, it becomes extremely complex. And since you uh, argued that um, it's important to, to see uh, how that can be implemented in a, in a company like YouTube, um, I think it would be extremely interesting to have, have uh, this kind of view in. We might appreciate it as a smart regulatory move, but um, when it um, is not really feasible in practice, then um, looks good on paper, but uh, will have not the desired effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, uh, I am. Uh, the, uh, there was once one of the GDPR um, uh, uh, regulators, so one of the authors of the GDPR, he likes telling the story that you know whenever uh, the, the companies would tell him this can't be done, he would find some tech person who would tell them how, how it could be done. And uh, I, I'm not sure that they're always right, you know. I mean, if, if, if taking taking up Wolfgang here, um, how, how do you see interaction between between uh, uh, YouTube and uh, at Brussels working better in the future? I mean, companies um, reportedly spend more on, on lobbying than, than for other acts. Uh, did, that didn't quite seem to work out the way you planned, or is it just you know the the, the facts of today's uh, regulatory landscape that that uh, you, you have to deal with certain um, let's say uh, less than desired uh, uh, details in the regulation. I mean, I think I would have accepted that there's going to be regulation and they're going, there's going to be updated laws and, and that's going to be the future um, that, that will continue to work closely with governments. And, and I, like I said, I, I definitely understand the need and why that's happening. A, a lot of the challenges that I have seen are that, um, is that, is that the implementation doesn't always... Um, it doesn't always make sense. And so maybe the intention is good, but the actual implementation of it, um, you know, isn't possible or is, or is difficult or has these negative unintended consequences. Um, and so, you know, our, our view on it has just been the need for us to continue to, to, to discuss this and to understand. And I think certainly having, I mean, certainly having technical experts um, who are part of the regulation and who are part of um, drafting these laws would, could help because they could have an understanding of how, you know, better understanding of, you know, what is possible, what's not possible, um, and uh, make sure that we're, that we're working together on that. But, um, you know, there were, there were certain, like, I mean, I can talk about Article 13 at some point, um, you know, I think we got to a good place on that in, in the end. I mean, we're still working out some of the details of it, but you know, at some point the law was written in a, in a way that I was, I was very seriously concerned that it was going to shut down in a significant way YouTube's um, distribution and, and content creation um, in Europe. And um, so you know, that's why we put a lot of energy into explaining what the implications were, and and copyright, for example, is a very complex area. Um, I'm not I, after all this time of trying to understand all the details of it. There's still a lot of nuances um, at, that that you know that like I'm getting explained by lawyers or various um, experts in the field. So it was just it's just an example of how I think something that was well intentioned sometimes can have these unintended consequences. And so that's what 
we think is important is that we're able to to explain it and to come back and you know in many ways like youtube people might look at youtube like youtube's a big company you know we we are big you know potentially american company but we are a platform that represents millions of small creators and businesses and if if something happens that causes those creators to not generate revenue or to lose their distribution that has all kinds of consequences um, so we paid out 30 billion in the last three years to all of our creators there's over two million of them um, and they don't have any kind of lobbying arm it's not like they're meeting with any kind of regulators they're small businesses um, and um, so like Sally Velt for example is a creator in Germany she does cooking and baking um, she has almost 2 million subscribers uh, she has 100 employees she does you know, baking products or Kurtz Gesagt is does educational content. They have almost 17 million subscribers. So, but they're not going to have a lobbying arm. They're not going to have someone who goes to Brussels and follows the laws and follows GDPR and D, uh, DMA and DSA. Um, and so, we need to do that for them. Otherwise, it has various implications. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure that that, that Kurtz Gesagt at some point uh, uh, would do it. Would do a, 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 a little. Uh, a video on on the importance of of, of good regulation, um, but then again, um, we we you know one of the one of the ideas we we had when we created this this series, the which the, the first event of is is today, is to have better exchange between platforms and academia, um, and that's something which is also in the uh, DSA and also by the way in the Network Enforcement Act, which uh, a new clause of of which uh, came into force just a couple of days ago. Um, so there's better access to, to for other academics to 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 platform uh, platform data. Um, Susan, do you think that this sort of is is, is a step to the right direction? So that uh, is better access by scientists to to platform data. Good, will that lead to better research results, uh, or um, should we be asking rather other other kinds of questions? I, I think it is good, and I, I do think academics and experts play a key role in um, having more transparency and being able to understand our platforms and how they work and how they change. And um, you know, there certainly have been various academic reports and analysis on YouTube, but we we recognize we need to do more to give more more tools to academics to be able to better understand how our systems are working and being able to to report on it and and have that academic integrity so they can publish you know what makes sense um and, and understand how our systems work so I, I do think that is yeah and that is something we're working on what is the right way for us to open up um further for academics to have more insights into our business Wolfgang, uh, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm happy to hear that, uh, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> because we are interested in that. But um, before we maybe talk a little bit about that, um, self-critical reflection, what I very often hear from academic colleagues and uh, maybe myself is we want more data, um, but we are not really specific about what data we want and uh, what for, <laughs> what questions do we want to answer. And I think uh, there is on, on our side, on the academic side, the need to be more concrete. So to say, if we want to learn about um, uh, distribution and effects of, of disinformation, we need to have some data that shows at what e effect has uh, fact checking and labeling and things like that. What does that actually mean in terms of sharing content and so on? Um, so be more specific and then maybe come in, in closer cooperation with uh, uh, YouTube and others and, and have uh, specific um, demands here. So um, I would love to see more cooperation here, obviously. And if we can talk yeah. about what the obstacles are right now, what the mutual yeah. benefits could be. Uh, I know it's, it's a complex thing. It's about uh, data protection and, and data quality and a uh, bunch of, of questions that, that come with that. Um, but if one could develop a path to, to more cooperation here, I think it would yeah. be beneficial to all and the society. Yeah, I mean, I, I I agree. I mean, our our goal the the more that regulators and academics understand YouTube, the, I think the more aligned we will be in how we handle regulation going forward. And so, um, 
I, I actually always find when I meet with uh, a representative or a political person who has a YouTube channel, like they can ask me a lot of questions and, and it, we can have a really thorough conversation about where we both agree we could do better um, and what we're what currently is working well. So in general, uh, you know, the more we can be aligned, the more we can be um, have a common understanding of the platform and, and the value we provide and then you know, where we need to do more, the better we'll be working together. And there is another aspect um, which I find extremely interesting, and that is that um, um, because you and, and the other platforms uh, have to deal with a lot of problematic content uh, pieces, uh, you know so much about communication, about extremism and so on. I think one of the biggest uh, think tanks on, on extremism all over the world is within the platforms because they have to know what's happening there, how do the codes change that, that specific groups use and so on. And I think there could be a lot of cooperation and maybe there is already uh, between those experts there and the people in academia working on, on these kind yeah. of things. Yeah, I mean, I also would say what's been really helpful have been when there are experts, right? So like violent extremism isn't really, you know, when I first started working at Google, I never thought that would be something that any of my work would ever, ever be involved in. And so, you know, there are organizations like GIFCT, which is a global internet forum for, for counterterrorism, which is a really valuable way that both Uh, platforms and governments can come together and you can hire expertise and come up with a lot of shared learnings. Um, we see that the Tech Coalition, for example, with regard to child safety is another important area. So I've always been really supportive of having third party groups that are those experts that really can um, hire a set of people who are very knowledgeable, work with tech companies, and we can come up together with what the right ways of um, having regulation and what the best shared practices are together. So uh, that to me has been very successful. That's, a, that's actually a, a perfect segue to, to the, the, the segment uh, where we were looking at some of the questions we've received from, from our, uh, our audience uh, across mm -hmm. the world. Um, you, you mentioned um, third parties and, and other, other groups. One question um, by, by, by Philip uh, asks, um, Whether um, there is, uh, whether you've entertained the idea of somehow democratizing the uh, the the content moderation process by implementing some sort of peer review or public review, especially regarding scientific content, as that gets more and more complicated. So mm -hmm. perhaps you know, rephrasing, can there be like a Wikipediaization of the of the content review, or is that a bit too difficult to entertain on a on a scale and at that speed? Yeah, uh, well, I think there's a lot of interesting ideas there, um, certainly. And um, I mean, t t like I'll answer it on a few different levels, which first of all, we enable anyone to flag information. Um, we also have trusted flaggers. So people who are experts in their area that flag information that's problematic. But I think, you know, here you're talking more about, um, you know, institutional or academic content and using a peer review type of system. Um, and, you know, Google actually... If you look, think, you know, Google's initial algorithms, PageRank, in many ways benefited from that same idea of like, it didn't actually have peer review, but it actually looked at who was linking to those articles and what was the trust of the sources that were linking to them. So in many ways, it was a, it was a technical implementation of, of this peer review idea. Um, and You know, I do think there's a lot of value in having the discussion and having other groups being able to endorse documents. Um, and that's certainly something that we could look at further. Um, I've always wanted you to do that um, in the comments. So we actually have been experimenting with, for example, with this timed comment. So you can say at this moment, you know, right where they say X, like, do you agree or not agree? Um, and enabling Uh, there to be more discussion and commentary, not about the video as a whole, but about actually specific items that were mentioned. In. And that's actually a feature that we currently have. Um, but anyway, lots of, lots of, that's a very rich idea of how to add more peer commentary and more discussion around specific talks um, or videos. Thank you. Uh, Wolfgang, do you have a, a, a comment on that? Yeah, maybe. Um... A lot of things that <laughs> you could say uh, uh, from an academic perspective. And um, I think one of the ideas behind the question can be that uh, 
uh, we see that uh, these platforms have this immense role in private and public communication. And um, so you have this idea of um, bringing the people in, the citizens in, uh, not just as users and, and content creators, but also as having some view in um, how the platform is shaped and how, how the mm -hmm. rules are implemented. And um, there are a lot of ideas around and you can see the whole debate on oversight boards and things like that as something uh, going to this direction. And um, for us in academia, it's interesting to see what different models are uh, conceivable here. Um, and what the right path forward could be. And my take on that is that's not just one path. There can be different ways to experiment with these kind of things. Yeah. Well, one thing I'll just say is like, you know, we've been very supportive of working with different third parties to be able to help think through some of the frameworks or whether the, you know, at a, at a high level, um, you know, and we, again, like I mentioned, we understand the need for, for regulation at a high level. But what we have seen is that when there is a crisis, the platform needs to be able to make that decision immediately. It can't go to some kind of third party to make that decision. Like when people were destroying telecom equipment because of COVID, you know, we had to make that decision within an hour. Um, are we going to allow this or not? No, we're not, um, you know, decision done. So there is a lot of, I think the, there's a lot of important discussion you know in general about our platforms but then to be responsible on the day-to-day -day, um, the platforms need to be empowered to make those decisions right as as if current events are happening even though i, I would assume that the uh, the the science behind that um behind that uh, question wasn't wasn't too too difficult to, to parse no it was it was there was no medical can no medical authority thought that 3g towers were the cause of covid Yes, thank you. Um, when another question we received um, uh, to Susan specifically, what do you think will be the, the next big thing when it comes to content uh, moderation? So is there going to be an iconoclastic achievement uh, in, in uh, machine learning that will lead to uh, semantic superior machines that will actually be able to, to do a very good job in content moderation or will humans always have a certain uh, role? Oh, I, you know, I think that humans will always play some role. Um, I think that we, I mean, we have seen the machines do get better. The, the, there's no question that you can continue to train them and the, and the AI will continue to get better. But I, I do think that humans will always play a role in particular with um, really sensitive content. And um, I mean, I, I think with With content moderation, you know, it's been complex for us, realistically. It's complex for everyone to understand what our policies are. We do publish them. We try to be transparent. Um, and so you know, I do, I'm hopeful going forward that, um, you know, that we can continue to have, you know, a good common understanding of, of what the guidelines are and continue to work with experts and third parties to continue to refine them. And like we've just found it takes a lot of detail work to really define them super clearly that they can be implemented consistently. So consistency is a very important thing. When we have a policy, we need to make sure that no matter where that video is submitted from around the world, that we get the consistent rulings on them um, and that we need to be able to explain that to our teams. So, um, you know, um, certainly, certainly machine like using machines to help improve the consistency, find um, more of the potentially violative content, do so with higher accuracy rates, would all be good improvements for us in the future. And with that, you're very much in line with um, recent judgments in, in Germany, you know, calling for more coherence and more consistency across the, mm -hmm. the moderation practices. Mm -hmm. um, we, we're, we're nearing the, the end of, of, our, um, of the first edition of, of Insights uh, and Power. Uh, perhaps one, one last mm -hmm. uh, wish. Uh, what, what can mm -hmm. science do better if you... What can science do better and Wolfgang, what can platforms do better? <laughs> Susan, if you want to begin. Uh, I mean, I, I, you know, again, I, we recognize it's a partnership um, and we plan to continue to work closely together. I, I do think the more that the, the um, more that there can be an understanding of YouTube and we're working really hard. A lot of what we do is also just working for people to understand what YouTube is and how it works and the role that we play. Um, and, and certainly the more that we can have a shared common understanding about 
the value and and how our systems work and and where we need to agree that there has to be change going forward um, and really see that as a partnership so that that would be my goal is to continue to work on both the partnership um, and the shared and common understanding thank you awesome. Yeah, I can definitely uh, catch this ball and uh, throw it back into the um, court of, of uh, the companies and YouTube. Um, I definitely see it as a partnership as well. And we very often come to the conclusion that uh, each stakeholder has to do his role and his responsibility has to be defined. Um, and between companies and, and uh, academia, I think there are already some really fruitful corporations, um, but uh, if uh, YouTube and others are open to, to uh, make more here, then we are very happy to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, both to uh, Professor Wolfgang Schultz and uh, the Schultz and to Susan Wojtitski, CEO of, of YouTube, for joining us today uh, at this first edition of Insights and Power, the conversation series between uh, platform decision makers and internet scientists. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much to uh, Wiebke Schon and Katharina Mosene at the Breda Institute and Christian Graufogel at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society and to our media partners at TIDE Hamburg for making this possible. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, it was a pleasure having uh, both of you uh, here online. And uh, I wish you a wonderful day and also to all of us listening. Thank you so much. Thank you so much Thank for you. the time. Thank you all. Thank you, Susan.